speaking of uh, the EU, um, you know, this is uh, Theory Breton, who is the head of uh, like the EU's, what is the title? Oh, Commissioner for Internal Market of the European Union. And he se- basically, he seems to have become the EU's face of online censorship. And this is him threatening Elon Musk ahead of his August live stream with Trump on X. Uh, he's refer- He says, you know, with great audience comes greater responsibility. And by posting this conversation with Trump on X, there's a risk of amplifying potentially harmful content in the EU. And he references this letter that he sent to them where he says, I'm writing to you in the context of recent events in the UK and in relation to the planned broadcast on your platform. Uh, You have a legal obligation to ensure X's compliance with EU law. This notably means ensuring on one hand that freedom of expression uh, uh, and of information and on the other that all proportionate and effective mitigation measures are put in place regarding the amplification of harmful content. This is important against the background of recent examples of public unrest brought about by the amplification of content that promotes hatred, disorder, incitement to violence or certain instances of disinformation. So, you know, you're you're saying, Glenn, that the EU is kind of taking notes on what Brazil's doing and and uh, incorporating that into their own guidance. But it it really is kind of next level because the EU in the past has been really influential in shaping global Internet policy. So, like, what do you think this kind of saber rattling we see from Breton pretends for free speech worldwide? Yeah, I mean, the EU is very far down this road. The other country where Rumble is unavailable is France. And the reason for that is is at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, the EU made it illegal, illegal for any uh, social media company or service provider to platform RT, Sputnik, or any other Russian state media. So if you're an adult citizen of the EU and you want to hear what the Russian government is saying about this war that your country has involved you in to a great extent, you're barred from hearing it. You're not allowed to. There's no one that's allowed anymore to even allow people to hear RT. And when Rubble refused and said, we're not going to censor RT just because you, the French government, tell us to, the, the way Google did, they immediately removed RT from YouTube. The French threatened to ban Rumble at the IP level, and 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 now as a result, Rumble is unavailable in France as well. So you're absolutely right; the EU is not very is- far behind Brazil. And I think you know, I know we're going to talk about this in a second, but the decision by the French government to lure the Telegram founder Pavel Durov to French territory and then arrest him and charge him with multiple felonies happened just a few days before Brazil banned X. And I think every time one country goes a little bit further down the censorship road. It, impulse, it it incentivizes and kind of gives the green light to other countries to go further down. I think that was one of the reasons why Brazil felt confident enough to ban X was that they just watched Fran- France arrest Telegram, which, and, and Brazil has had its own wars with Telegram over their refusal to censor, their inability to serve them with censorship orders. So uh, Thierry Breton is this sort of censorship extremist. Even the EU has kind of distanced themselves a little bit from him. But he still <laughs> occupies this this important office in Brussels, and they have been threatening X primarily, um, sort of using Elon as this demon to get their hooks into real censorship over the internet, even more than they already have. They've all enacted these new laws. The EU has this Digital Services Act. The UK has this online censor- this online safety act. It's called Canada has C11 and C44 and other laws that are designed to give them even more censorship power. Obviously, there's movements in the U.S. primarily from the Democrats to try and justify censorship of the internet on the grounds of making platforms responsible for disinformation or hate speech, which they decide in their own discretion what counts as that. So it is a very international movement and it's being fed more and more. And I I find it extremely alarming because the internet is the only weapon we have left to communicate freely with one another, to not rely on major centralized corporate structures that in turn depend on appeasing the government. That was the whole promise of the internet. That's the reason why I have a career. That's the reason why I've been able to do reporting. It's the reason why a lot of people have been able to do a lot of things all around the world. And to watch it now be the target increasingly of this effort to say, no, we have to control what can be said. We have to ban people who say things we don't want to be said. To me, it's 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 extremely dangerous and extremely alarming. 
Jumping on the French is um, one of my favorite hobbies. So we're real thrilled to be able to get to do this at Let's work. Let's do that. Yeah, you, Glenn. Um, but I want to take us to the um, arrest uh, of, of Pavel Durov, the, the founder of Telegram, the encrypted messaging app, because I think it's it's really interesting. And I think it possibly portends something about how the Section 230 battles might play out in the United States. Um, I mean, one of the things that we saw that I think is so interesting for those who are not aware is that the French authorities, so they they lured Durov there and then they arrested him at the airport. And the charges are are so far, you know, they're still sort of being hashed out. But some of the things that they were throwing around are kind of fascinating, right? Telegram's lack of moderation and cooperation in the fight against pedo criminality. Um, very much hinting at the fact that they are planning on charging him and holding him accountable for um, the actions facilitated by this platform, the actions of people who are not him, uh, and attempting to really erase some of these important distinctions that, at least in the United States, we hold very dear between, um, you know, a, a platform, a host of content, and the content itself and those who carry out uh, and are inspired by that content or that speech to do criminal acts, right? We tend to crack down on the crime itself, not the mere hosting of a platform, which is, an, uh, the, you know, provides the ability uh, for people to engage in acts of commerce or acts of speech that perhaps the authorities don't like. But the, these... These distinctions between platform um, and and the actual crimes themselves seem to be just erased in a very widespread manner. Um, what does the French arrest of Pavel Durov tell us about the future and the degree to which uh, platform creators are going to be held liable for the content shared on those platforms? Glenn? It's a major escalation. And I know for a fact that it has put significant amounts of fear into the hearts of billionaire tech executives who run social media platforms because yes. things like not being able to travel to France without being arrested is a prerogative of, of being a billionaire tech executive. And it's really a way of showing that we don't care who you are. I mean, Pavel Durov is a multi-billionaire. He founded what essentially is the Russian uh, the yeah. Russian uh, version of Facebook and then fled Russia when the Russian government demanded that he hand over all sorts of data about the people in Ukraine who were fighting against the pro-Russian government and other dissidents in Russia. He refused. It was after the Sun reporting that he founded Telegram based on, with his brother, based on the need to provide end-to-end -end encryption and to prevent government interference. So what you see here is that standard authoritarian playbook. Like anytime the government wants to seize power, censorship power, or anything else, they need to put a villain, a demon, some sort of fear-mongering in front of the population to say, if you don't allow us to do this, we can't protect you from these scary threats. And pedophilia or sex trafficking, I remember when we were doing the Snowden reporting, the part of the NSA's excuse was, well, one of the things we we do with these systems is we find sex traffickers and, and pedophiles and child pornographers. And I you know, was like, I spent the last year of my life reading through all your documents. If like one half of 1% of it is devoted to any of those things, that's a lot. That was the pretext. They wanted to say, oh, we need these systems to protect you from these scary things. That's obviously what the French are doing. The much more important threat it's is what you said, which is this theory. You know, it would be like if if someone plotted a murder over telephone lines and then we prosecuted AT&T executives for failure to monitor those lines, for failure to cut service off to extremists. We said because they used your service to plot these terrible crimes, you are now criminally responsible. Obviously, if you hold tech companies responsible, not for the crimes they commit, but for the crimes committed by people on their platforms, what you're essentially incentivizing them to do, and this is the whole goal, is to err on the side of censorship and censor everything other than the most banal, obviously, uh, establishment-pleasing sentiments. That's the whole point of that theory. And Section 230 was you know, enacted long ago based on the recognition that you could never have a free internet unless you said that tech platforms and social media companies were not responsible for the things that were posted or expressed on their platforms because the minute you hold them responsible for that a free internet ends and that's what the arrest of Pavel Durov is intended to convey to all these sex executives including Elon I would say maybe primarily him which is we don't care how rich you are we don't care how powerful you are we will put you in a prison cell if you don't start censoring more more actively to what degree is the war on Section 230 and the war on encryption really something that's a total outcropping of um, or an outgrowth of the misinformation, disinformation industry? 
what I mean by that specifically is I like I don't know if that fully makes sense, but what I mean by that is like uh, it's almost like we have entered into this era where instead of believing that free speech reigns above all and is the most important thing to secure and is something that um, you know citizens of a democracy can absolutely handle and they can sift through things and decide what is true and uncover partial truths um, as they see fit. Instead of that, we've veered into this very paternalistic, condescending territory where we believe that if people, or we seemingly believe, um, or at least the authorities do, that if people have exposure to things that might possibly be untrue via a platform, or if they have the ability to do unsavory things via a platform, that we must crack down on the platform and the creators of it itself, or that we must content moderate um, bad things out of sight, as opposed to believing that people can see things that they disagree with or be exposed to bad things and still manage to, you know, trudge through them. Is all of this a little bit the fault of the misinformation, disinformation industry, Glenn? I, I would say yes and no. Like, and, and the reason I say no is that if you, you go back to the mid-1990s when the advent of the internet really began, when it was understood that this is going to be an important technology, I think maybe Paul Krugman didn't understand it. He thought it would be as important as the fax machine, but everyone else understood how important it was. One of the very first things that happened was the Clinton administration took the attack on the Oklahoma City courthouse which was then attributed to this menace of right-wing militias all over the country and said, these people are going to use the internet if they can use it freely and with privacy to plot the destruction of our country. And as a result, we need what was called the chipper clip or a backdoor to encryption, meaning you can yep. lock everybody else out of these communications, but not the government. We need to have access. And the excuse Which was a terrorist attack. By the way, like that's not encryption if you can't keep the government out of it. That's fake encryption. Right. If you if you build a, a back door that you don't lock because you want your kids to get in after school, everyone else can also use that back door, not just your kids, like your neighbors, thieves, anyone. And that's, of course, the problem with the back door to the internet is you build it for the government and then anyone else can use it as bad as it is even to have it for the government. So, but back then there was a sense that, no, the internet is way too important to preserve as a realm of privacy. Remember, people usually use the internet anonymously. That's not part of its power. People were very free to say whatever they wanted. That was part of that sort of triumphalist rhetoric around what the internet would be. But as I said, I I do think that in the United States, there is this problem that people who want to censor have, which is that all of us really are indoctrinated with the idea that free speech is the primary value. I remember one of the first articles I wrote was, as a journalist, was right after there was was this uh, Holocaust denialist professor of history, David Irving. And he was working at a uh, college in in Austria, I believe, Um, maybe France, maybe Austria. And he was criminally convicted and sentenced to three years in prison because of what he was saying about the Holocaust and his revisionist version of history. And I remember writing saying like, look, Americans are very polarized politically. The right and the left think they have nothing in common. But like as Americans, I think we all pretty much recoil at the notion you can be punished by the state for your view of history, even if it's false. It's like the one thing that we're kind of inculcated with at birth is to be an American means you have the right to say whatever you want and no one can punish you for it. And I think the attempt after this trauma of 2016 of Brexit and Trump was to say, okay, how can we censor the internet without appearing as if we're politically censoring? And the idea was let's create a science, a sort of expertise, a apolitical, neutral expertise. And overnight there appeared these these disinformation experts like where did they come from what credential do they have to arbitrate truth and falsity not in one given profession like not like it's a cardiologist opining on the heart these are like roving arbiters of truth who suddenly call themselves disinformation experts and so the justification became because i don't think hate speech is a very strong justification because people understand it's hard to define that that no the only thing we're not censoring political dissent we're just censoring false claims fake news disinformation and the people who will decide that isn't the state, it's these scholars, these experts, these people trained to identify disinformation, a completely fraudulent credential, a completely fraudulent expertise. But I think that has become the primary justification. There's been polling. You ask Americans, should the state or big tech have the authority or the obligation to censor the internet to combat disinformation? And something like three quarters of Democrats say yes, and 25% of Republicans say yes. It's been a very successful propagandistic campaign to depict political censorship as some sort of apolitical scientific endeavor. 
Yeah, and what disturbs me about the Telegram case in particular is the way that it seems to be going after those the technical layer, the encryption layer, because that that is the that is the protection against you know if we have a society turning more illiberal and more uh, prone to censorship, then the tools of encryption are what would seem to protect against that sort of action. And and this is, I, I've seen like remarkably little commentary about this, but like one aspect of the French law uh, is actually that they require a license for <laughs> cryptography. Uh, I pulled this from a uh, trade organization, which we'll link, and it says the means of cryptology are subject to a specific control by French authorities, which require that such means of encryption should be declared or authorized before they are subject to intra-community transfers, import or export to or from France. Um, that is just uh, wild to me. Um, and it seems to be uh, an attack on just a really fundamental aspect of online privacy. I, I'll give a quick shout out to one of the projects combating this, which is Noster, a completely decentralized protocol that has no founder for France to arrest. That's ultimately... The final escape hatch, as far as I'm concerned. But obviously, this is something near and dear to your heart, Glenn, as someone who broke the Snowden story. Like, what happens if countries actually start banning encryption or trying to ban encryption altogether? Uh, encryption is completely central to a free and open internet. It's the thing that prevents the NSA from being able to spy on your conversations more easily than they already can, or other governments or police agencies with no warrants anyone who wants to harm you in any way. So if you start attacking the backbone of encryption, either regulating it or banning it or making it extremely difficult to use it unless the state approves of your use of it, probably will approve of your use of it or the type of encryption precisely because they know that you will give them access when they want it. Um, then you're, as, as Liz suggested earlier, if you have any access to encryption, you have universal access to encryption. There's there's no more protection to it the minute you build a backdoor for anybody. And this is why, of all the things in Brazil, too, that have happened, I think the most disturbing is the attempt to make it illegal to use VPNs because these are the tools that we, are, we right. have to keep the internet free despite the best attempts of authoritarian governments to try and control it, to try and intervene in it, to try and monitor people, to try and surveil it. So when you start legislating against the use of encryption or VPNs or making them, in the case of France and Dura, illegal, criminal. What you're essentially doing is saying that the internet will no longer be a place where you have even the most minimal amounts of privacy, the most minimal ability to evade or escape from the controls we're seeking to impose. It will be an instrument that we control fully there's no technological defense against our authority and our power and our capacity in order to invade it and manipulate it and control it for our own interests. And I do think, again, that's why the Durab indictment is a massive escalation because the whole theory on which it's based is that there's now this new set of legal obligations that even the most tech powerful tech executives of the world have to comply with, even if they're not a citizen of France or a citizen of the country doing it, just if they're, they're available in there. And if they don't, they could be prosecuted, criminally prosecuted as felons for either failing to comply with these new encryption obligations that allow the government to control it, or even worse, being held responsible for their failure to have uh, censored or moderated or turned over to the government allegedly criminal activity conducted by people using their platforms, which is, a, as I said, a, a guarantor to ensure pervasive censorship. And, and, and that's why the Durop thing being followed so closely by Brazil's banning of X just shows, I don't think it came out of nowhere. I think people could see it coming for a long time. It's been building and building, but these are big, big leaps by the democratic world, not by governments considered uh, typically authoritarian, but by the good the good countries, as we're told in the West, that are now doing this in, in very aggressive ways. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Just Asking Questions. You can watch another one here or the full episode there. We have an audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to using the link in the description and subscribe to Reason TV for notifications when these episodes go up every Thursday. Hope to see you then.